Welcome everyone to today's mentorship series. This is Agatha Ninsima, the Vice Chairperson of the Young Lawyers Committee, East African Law Society. And we are going to be starting in a few. Today we are going to observe time. And uh, our panelists are already here with us. Our keynote speaker is well also here with us. Um, I guess we should go ahead and start the session. Um, welcome everyone, our attendants. Um, we can see that people attending the session have also joined. Uh, briefly, today's mentorship series is about law as a business. As young lawyers, we find ourselves um, coming out of law school and getting into the legal practice. And some of us actually open our law firms as soon as um, we come out of, of, of law school in some jurisdictions, like in Kenya. And really, we don't get a chance to understand how to carry out uh, legal practice as a business. Yet other professions have um, had the opportunity to carry out their professions as businesses. Uh, we find so many young lawyers uh, disadvantaged because they are not trained or they are not mentored into treating legal practice as a business. People just be in jobs or and when the opportunity comes to open um, a law firm, you're not certain what is required of you to actually carry out um, the legal profession as a business. Yet, as lawyers, we are meant to earn from this profession, and some young lawyers are entirely doing legal practice as the only um, source of income. So today's session, really, we are looking forward to learning from uh, our panelists, from our keynote speaker, how they have carried out legal practice as a form, um, as a, in a business way, how you can make profit out of it, how you can um, sell yourself as an individual because the legal practice, you are the business as an individual. So we look forward to learning, we look, uh, we look forward to getting to know uh, those of us who have not yet ventured out to start our own practices to see how we can carry out legal practice as a business and also the different aspects of the business that um, we need to look out uh, for as we start out. But even those young lawyers that have started out, how they can treat their practice as a business. Um, without wasting any more time, I want to call um, Harriet, who's going to straight away introduce our keynote speaker for today, who is well versed with the legal practice, with a wealth of experience, um, so let me call upon Harriet to unmute and introduce our keynote speaker for the day. Uh, thank you, Ms. Agatha, for the uh, very kind in the invitation. Uh, for, for today's session, it will be for, for two hours, divided in two parts, uh, in, in three parts, sorry. The first part will be on the keynote address. Uh, which will be by Alex, Mr. Alex Rezida, who is a senior advocate in the courts of Judicator of Uganda with 27 years of standing as of 2016 and a commissioner for oaths. He has uh, engaged uh, over the years in different engagements and has had occasion to advise on establishment on several public-private partnerships. Uh, Presently, he, he is the chairperson of the Bar Bench Commercial Court Users, Commercial, uh, Commercial Court Users Committee of the Ugandan Law Society. He is a member of the Ugandan Law Society, the East African so so Society, and the International Bar Association. Uh, without further ado, I would invite him to present, to make his presentation. Welcome, Mr. Alex Rezida, Senior Counsel. Mr. 
Ms. Agatha? Um, Thanks, hello. Harriet. Uh, okay, we can hear you now, senior counsel. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Agatha, and thank you, Harriet, for that kind of introduction. Uh, colleagues, uh, as the topic suggests, it's uh, quite pertinent that we have an opportunity to step back and uh, look at law as a business. I'm singularly grateful for the privilege of giving this address to young lawyers and by extension to the legal fraternity across East Africa. This is part of the monthly mentorship series that East Africa Law Society is running for young lawyers. But we all benefit by sharing experiences. The ethos of today's conversation is law as a business, a guide to establishing an efficient practice model. For those of us that trained in the East Africa law schools, and uh, I suppose we are in the majority. We agree that uh, law was and is largely still not appreciated as a business. We are honored this afternoon to have eminent uh, panelists that we talk about to us about the attendance of an efficient practice model. I will therefore do my best not to encroach on their presentations. Uh, otherwise, I would be replicating and preempting what they are going to share with us this afternoon. I will therefore lean more on the aspect of law as a business. A while ago in 2016, when Uganda Law Society celebrated 60 years of its existence, I wrote an article that was published in the Monitor newspaper, whose theme was lawyers in the economy. The attempt of that article was to draw lawyers out of the usual, the written things, and focus on the written things that we as lawyers should always get opportunities to remind ourselves about. That article will be availed to the participants, uh, whoever is interested, I've given it to the organizers of this webinar. The gist of that article, as that of today, was to share what is not taught in the East African law schools, at least not as yet. In other jurisdictions, law is truly appreciated as a business, so much so that in 2014, Gatley, a mid-sized firm in the United Kingdom, appointed its first non-lawyer equity partner. That partner was simply investing in a business and expected a return on that, uh, on that investment. So the conviction he had was that this is a business. I invest in it and I will make money out of it. Now, if a non-partner can, what about us as lawyers, the owners of this business? Why are we not emphasizing the fact that indeed law is a business? In 2015, that law firm made history as the first one in the United Kingdom to float shares on the stock exchange. And as you know, you don't float shares on the stock exchange unless it's a viable business, a good business that the public will believe in, the public will invest in. We know that by law and regulation, this thing has efficiency as a prerequisite. So why this thing is far off for law firms globally? The Getle bold moves illustrate the need to run law firms as a business and to do so efficiently. So efficiently that even non-lawyers would have the confidence of investing in the business. When we start law firms, we want to succeed. How can we accomplish that success if we do not view law as a business? Do we have 
business plans of any sort? How many of us start with business plans? Evidence that you thought through this practice as a business and you charted out a path that you want to follow to accomplish the success that you are dreaming of. The key guidelines, the key guideline is to always remember that preceding accomplishment must be desire. Preceding accomplish, accomplishment must be desire and not just a wish. This demands of us strength of purpose. We must be purpose driven. The business of law falls in the category of the service industry whose deliverables are intangible, but variable. In broad terms, an efficient model of a law firm has to focus on four pillars at the very least. These are service delivery, professionalism, revenue, and sustainability. Each of these has its unique drivers. And what matters most is how these drivers and how these tenants are combined to enhance efficiency. In this webinar, we shall hear about those drivers. Over time, the nature alignment and functionality of law firms has been changing. Some of these changes have been accelerated by the new normal that has been universally and inescapably dictated onto legal practice and humanity by the COVID-19 pandemic. The immediately discernible changes visited on us by this pandemic are less physical inter interaction, and we now see it in many forms including this webinar, including the AGMs for the law societies that are now virtually held, including engagements with clients, meetings with clients. Either we have a hybrid or we have a pure virtual meetings. And those of us that sit on boards, that was so common across the board. The other, is change in work style. Many of us still have colleagues that are working from home at least part of the time. Then there are adaptable business models that are changing, that are adapting to the new normal. Inevitably, the budget discipline is enhanced. And this is significant when you talk about law as a business. Remembering that when businesses, when clients have to revise their budgets, have to do budget cuts, one of the obvious areas that suffer cuts are the legal costs. And it is important that we therefore do our best not to be seen as a cost center to clients. You become an easy target for those adjustments, and this has a significant impact on law as a business. The other is uh, the health awareness, the health risk. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we've all had colleagues that have had uh, this challenge of COVID. Uh, I know that uh, Uganda Law Society uh, this year has lost a number of uh, members to COVID-19. The other immediate uh, discernible change is the aligning priorities. Are you, as a lawyer, as a firm, giving service a priority? How do we make ourselves priorities? This goes a lot to what we shall be hearing uh, about from the panelists this afternoon. 
because the bigger answer on how a client appreciates you is derived from your efficiency and relevance. You must position yourselves to remain and be relevant at all times. There are glaring examples within the legal practice itself that the COVID-19 pandemic has dictated on us. One such example is the use of technology and the importance of data, which in time improve efficiency. We must at all times remember that we increase the efficiency, the space for time-based business, billing based on time, time-based business, that space is dwindling. Focus therefore is more on value that we can create and not how many hours we spend to accomplish a task. We have to keep in mind that there's no linear relationship between time and value. And this can be easily illustrated. I believe most of us are caught going. And we know that even if we are not caught going, we get into situations where we have to bind many documents, make many photocopies of authorities or materials relied upon, at times having to mark them or highlight certain parts that we want uh, to emphasize. That could take a whole hour. But in terms of value, it actually isn't the most valuable aspect of, of that work. You could spend half of that hour producing a legal opinion that is more valuable. And so when we say there's no linear relationship between time and value, what we are saying is it's not necessarily true that the longer a task takes, the more valuable it is. So efficiency makes us produce value in less time, which is why the time-based business, the time-based billing is now a thing to realign and realize that value-driven value deliverables will not respect that old model. There is a book that is titled uh, The New Dawn by Jaup Bosman and Lisa Hackinson. They are practitioners, very passionate practitioners. They argue that the value of a lawyer is not primarily in the knowledge of the law, but in the knowledge of the best market practice. How do you understand your market? This relates to efficiency. If you don't understand your market, how are you going to deliver, to drive your practice, to look at your priorities that matter for your clients? They argue that strategic insight, empathy, moral standard, creativity, and personality are key attributes when we talk about the value of a lawyer. And so the value of a good lawyer is primarily in the human skills. How are we enhancing these skills? How are we skill tooling? This has to be a continuous question. These same authors make a, make a good case of swarm intelligence as a fundamental necessity for an efficient legal practice model. SWAM intelligence is the combining of knowledge, creativity, and expertise available in a firm so as to find innovative solutions. This is critical in this age of continuous changes and continuous disruption. Evidently, it spares doom for the sole practitioner. That model of sole 
practitioner is glyphore inefficient. And so is setting up a law firm without adequate apprenticeship. Uh, at the beginning of this session, Agatha did make mention of just getting out of law school and setting up a firm. In my view, that is a recipe for disaster. We should discourage it. You cannot be efficient. You cannot train yourself. You cannot start this journey of legal practice right from law school and learn competitively. The current times, even for legal practice, are more entrepreneurial than ever before. And therefore that underscores the essence of looking at law as a business. What business are we doing? What business are we engaged in? How are we leveraging all the advantages that uh, a lawyer usually has? Remember, there are two professions that give instant recognition in society. The legal profession is one, and the other is the medical profession. And at times this gives us a false sense of importance, not knowing that actually that's just a formative stage and you are beginning to build a career. And so the day you make a decision to make a court to set up a farm, you need to step back and engage on the adequateness of your professional standing and opportunities that you may be able to tap into. And so I'm hoping that in part of the conversations we are going to have this afternoon, when we listen to the other panelists, the question of timing of when to set up a law firm and how to set up a law firm and as I said, avoiding the possibility of sole proprietorship will be canvas. I thank East Africa Law Society for a careful selection of eminent practitioners that are going to lead us in the conversation on the following. The law firm business model, and, and there isn't one model, attracting and retaining clients, leveraging on good branding and IT to serve clients better, charging fees, what consider when billing. The other is expense and spending management strategies for law firms. And under this is a whole spectrum as we shall hear. And especially the aspects of accounting, tax compliance, and so on, which are very important. Then there is the most important because all these, like the author said before, revolve about the most important aspect, which is the human resource. And so it is an honor that we have a presentation on staffing. And under that, we hear they must have professionals to get you started. With this rich menu, we shall be well guided on the establishment of an efficient practice model. Thank you for this opportunity and thank you to all the participants for your time and interest. We owe it to each other to continuously improve in what we do. Thank you so much. And it's my pleasure now to request that we now move on to the presentations from uh, the panelists that will take us to the different subjects. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Senior Counsel, Mr. Alex Rubida. Uh, we will then proceed to the next session, which is presentations by panelists. Uh, our first panelist will be Senior Counsel John Chigiti. 
Uh, he is an advocate practicing in Kenya, a member of the Law Society of Kenya, and is a celebrated pro bono advocate, passionate in mentoring young advocates. Uh, before we proceed with his presentation, I would like to inform the members that should you have any questions in regards to any specific presentation, kindly post on the side chat. They will be addressed during the plenary session and some of them will be answered at the, uh, after, uh, by the panelists as we progress with the presentations. Uh, uh, I would love to invite Mr. Chigiti for his presentation. Senior Council Tigiti. Uh, I'm informed that he is not yet in. Uh, we will proceed with the next panelist. Uh, our next panelist uh, will present on attracting and retaining clients, sorry, on charging fees and what to consider when billing. Uh, the name is uh, Ms. Stella Dikimi. She's a managing partner and heads advice and heads the advisory practice at Denton's East African Law Chambers. She's one of the leading corporate and commercial lawyers in Tanzania with a wealth of knowledge and over 16 years experience in advising on commercial law matters. Uh, the, bio, the full bio can be shared or, over time and we can proceed, Ms. Teller. Welcome. Thank you, Harriet, for the kind introduction. I hope that you can hear me clearly. As, yes, I can hear. As Harriet has said, my name is Astella Ndikimi. I'm the managing partner of Denton East African Law Chambers. Um, I'm humbled um, to be part of the panelists for this session. And um, I'm honored to, you know, to be in the midst of very good lawyers from across the region and thank you so much once again, Secretariat of the East African Law Society for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts, you know, on with, with, with colleagues within the profession on charging fees and what we need to consider when billing. Um, thank you so much, um, Senior Counsel, Mr. Rezida, for the kind introduction and the keynote speech, which has really been helpful. It's an eye opener for us, you know, um, when you hear that law firms have listed on the stock exchange, you know, these are the kind of things that we need to be thinking about because for so long, for so many years, you know, the, the practice of law and, you know, the law business has been run so much, you know, like, you know, a business that is so much inward looking. It is only recently that we have the confidence to talk of law firms as businesses. Um, otherwise, you know, when somebody asks you what you do, you will not say that you're in the business of law. You say that you're a lawyer, while in fact, you're actually running a business. So thank you so much, Senior Counsel Resida. I can see somebody has requested um, for the book, and I think I would be interested in getting myself a copy. If you could share the title, I missed it. Um, I would be interested to get myself a copy. Now, I would have really loved, um, Harriet, to listen to my co-panelists, um, particularly the one that would be, uh, would be discussing the law firm business model, Senior Counsel Chigiti. Um, it's unfortunate that I have to share my thoughts before him because I felt that I need to first understand, you know, the law firm business model before I can start talking about billing. I think billing comes subsequent to setting up of a law firm. But nonetheless, I'm happy to, to proceed. And of course, I'm very eager to, to learn and hear a little bit more from Senior Counsel Chigiti. Now, in terms of billing and what to consider when we are billing, I think for me, what is most important is as, you know, Senior Counsel Rezida said, we are running a business and we need to ensure that whatever model in terms of the setup, in terms of the billing, is a sustainable model. 
um, in the course of his discussion, Tina Kansorazida has told us that he, he wouldn't want us to go and start solo practices. Um, and I believe the danger in this is because when you run a solo practice, when you run an office by yourself, you become, you know, a master, um, a jack of all trade and master of nothing in particular, one, but two, you miss out on the key, you know, essentials of setting that law firm as a business. And I'm really not trying to discourage anyone from going solo. You know, some people thrive as sole soldiers, others thrive in a group. Um, but whatever way you look at it, if you're considering a business, you would not want to close your shop on a particular day because you have woken up not feeling well because, you know, you're suffering from a flu or something like that. And literally, if you look at law firm as a business and you're running solo, what it would mean is that if you had a breakdown, you know, health or family issues, you would have to close shop. And again, that defeats the purpose of running that business, that law firm as a business. And what guides us then, what the setup that you that you choose is what would also assist you in terms of your billing and your, you know, how you would charge your fees. Now, from a lawyer's perspective, the first thing that we would need to consider when, when it comes to charging fees is what the law says, because as advocates, um, we are in that I would call it an unfortunate profession where the law determines your, your, your remuneration um, even before you get the client. So in most of our jurisdictions, we have remuneration orders that guide you know, the fees that we, we should be billing for certain transactions or certain matters. And we always need to be guided by this. The good thing about the drafting of the law is that you know, it's not, um, and I believe this would apply in most of the jurisdictions, that the fees are basically guidelines that we need to apply. It's not, um, it's not mandatory that you stick to these fees, but it is, it is a guideline that you should, um, you should follow. It's a prescription that you need to have into, in, in mind whenever you are negotiating fees with clients. But other than the guideline that we have under the law, the most important is realization that you're delivering a service. You're selling a service to a client. Now, the way, the way you package your conversation around fees needs to be sensitive to the client's needs in terms of what it is that you're, you're, you're offering to provide to them. Now, when you, when you realize that you're providing a service, I think the first question that always comes to my mind is, if I was the client, would I buy, you know, the bargain that this lawyer is giving me? Would I be willing to pay a next amount of money for this service? Now, that is a consideration that you always need to have, and it becomes even more relevant when you delivered on the assignment, when you have delivered on a piece of work, be it litigation, be it a transaction assignment, be it a one-time sort of um, instruction that you have received. When you finally deliver the deliverable to the client, does the client feel that they have received value for the money that you're going to bill? And if the client has an issue in terms of your delivery, in terms of the quality of your work, you definitely would have a very difficult conversation with that client when it comes to billing. The other, the other aspect, of course, that would be most important, and I think this is somewhere that you know a lot of us need to need to always have in mind is being able to negotiate on your fees and to be clear on your fees before you commence instructions. We have seen so many times, you know, clients coming to you when they are hard pressed of time, you know, over, over need. And at that point in time, it actually sometimes feels inappropriate to have a discussion around fees. And often at times we find ourselves commencing instructions when the negotiations on fees and understanding has not been reached you know, in an unclear term, in very clear terms. So you commence an instruction when the fees are not properly negotiated. And when by the time you come to negotiate the, the fees, the urgency on the part of the client is gone. They do not think that the matter is as important as it was yesterday, because guess what? You have already solved half of their problem. Now, at this point, you kind of need to be very careful you need to be careful with the timing. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm a bit more clearer now. I, I can see a message that the audio is not very clear. 
um, please feel free to comment if you feel that I need to raise my voice a little bit more. So the timing in terms of negotiating your fees is an important aspect. You need to get your timing right. In most cases, you need to get a full understanding of what the scope of work is before you negotiate the fees. And once you negotiate the fees, of course, you need to keep your part of the bargain. Um, the other consideration that we need to, to bear in mind is the fact that given the kind of service that we deliver, often at times you will get an upfront fee, um, whatever the portion that may be, especially for assignments that where you're not billing on time. And once you, once you get these fees, you need to realize that as long as you have not delivered the work, that is not your money. The fees are not your money. You only um, earn that money once you have delivered on the assignment. Now, one of the mistakes that most young lawyers especially would make is when you get, when you get fees paid, and particularly for assignments where it's not a time-based billing, so you get a certain portion of your fees paid, you assume that you have earned some money. And we have seen um, actually, it used to be, you know, it used to be something that used to surprise me quite a bit. Um, lawyers disappearing, you take instructions, get a portion of the fees, and you decide to go on a holiday. You decide to go on vacation because you have some money with you. And, you know, not forgetting and not realizing that you have not delivered on the assignment. And therefore, that portion of the money that you've received is not your money yet. You have not earned it. So you need to respect the fact that you know you need to first deliver before you can appropriate the remuneration that you have received and once you know what once you do that what what basically that calls for is discipline discipline in terms of the way you handle your finances discipline in terms of the way you handle clients finances again we have to remember we are in a very noble profession where you your your client entrusts you fully with the money, with the work, and when they pay you a portion of the fee in advance, the, you know, there is that trust that you're going to deliver on the assignment. It is not very common for you to go and pay for services in advance, but as lawyers, we have that you know, privilege where you're able to negotiate a certain portion of the fees paid in advance before you do the work. Now, you need to keep that respect, you need to keep the trust, and you need to make sure that your client feels comfortable that you're going to deliver on the work despite the fact that you have received um, an amount of money prior to execution of the assignment. Again, you know, this brings in the, 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 the discussion on how do you bill? How do you know how much you should be billing? Now, we have different types of, of billing um, models, um, and it entirely depends on the nature of assignment, I would say. There are people who would go on a time-based sort of billing. There's in certain situations where you need to agree on, on fixed fees. There are times when you need to agree on capped fees. I believe the model that you choose on billing should be a model that leaves you comfortable. The last thing that you want to do is to negotiate and agree on fees with a client. And then you realize that you have shortchanged yourself or you have shot yourself in the foot after you have received instructions because the execution of those kind of instructions becomes very difficult where you feel that you're putting in so much of your time and effort and the remuneration that you're getting for it is not commensurate to the workload that you're carrying. So you always have to bear in mind, you know, what model would work best. For transaction assignments, in my personal experience, negotiating time-based um, time fee models works better because then you get paid for the time that you put. But of course, if you choose a time-based model, you have to be sensitive also in terms of what you deliver to the client. You do not want to be charging the client for upskilling. For example, if you need to upskill on your services, you cannot bill the client for inefficiencies. You know, that, that time that is not spent properly. If you have to file a document, you know, for 20 minutes, but it takes you two hours to get it filed because of inefficiencies within your registries or elsewhere. You cannot build a client for system inefficiencies. And we need to be sensitive about this kind of things. Again, realizing that you do not want to deal with your client as a one-time sort of, um, on a one-time sort of transaction or deal. You would want to make this client to develop a relationship with the client so that they can come back to you whenever they have a need. 
Um, the other aspect that I would that I would want to talk about is taking into consideration your 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 administrative costs and the disbursements that you incur on particular assignments. We have seen again situations where you negotiate fees and you forget that there is a disbursement or expenses that would be incurred in the execution of that assignment. And what this does, it eats into your fee portion. So as you negotiate your fees, you need to be aware of the costs, the incidental costs that you would incur as a business in delivering the instructions. And you need to be aware and alive to that so that when you negotiate your fees, you make a provision for the disbursements. If you need to negotiate higher, you know, a, a higher fee, or if you need to communicate to your client that the fees that we have agreed upon are exclusive of disbursements, exclu exclusive of any taxes that would be payable so that the amount that you negotiate is an amount that you feel comfortable with in terms of performing or executing the assignment that you're doing. And then of course, the, 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 the other item that I would want to talk about generally is then running your firm as a business because you need to realize that at the end of it all, it is a business. Now we have the guidelines in terms of the law on how much we should be billing. We have a sense of what the market is charging and that brings in another aspect and I'm sorry I forgot to speak about this is what your competition is doing. You need to be alive to what your competition is doing. You're running a business, you're not operating in isolation. You have colleagues within the profession, you have other law firms providing more or less similar services to the ones that you're providing. How much are they billing? You know, how much are they billing? What are their rates like? You need to put, have your ears to the ground to do your market intelligence so that you know where you belong. Who are you competing with? How much are they billing? It doesn't mean that you, you know, you obtain information um, in inappropriate ways from other law firms. It's just doing the general market intelligence that any other business out there does so that they can remain competitive in the market. Of course, we have other aspects that are provided for under the law, which I, I will ask that I do not focus too much on because I believe this session is more of a mentoring um, session. We have been taught in law school, we've all gone through the, you know, the, 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 the laws of etiquette you know, things like undercutting, overpricing, we have been taught in class. When you come out into the market um, and you feel that you need to win a certain client, how will you position your billing so that you remain competitive? Again, as, as we speak competition, you also need to be alive to the do's and don'ts of etiquette as a lawyer on what you can do and what you cannot do. You should not be undercutting you should not be soliciting for clients in inappropriate ways, et cetera, et cetera. And once all that is done, we need to remember that time is our stock in trade. You are putting in time into your client's work. You need to be remunerated appropriately for that time. But that also means that you need to be sensitive to the time that you're putting in and the billing that you're, 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 you're giving to your clients so that you do not bill them for work that ordinarily you should not be billing for. So if you're, if you're going to be billing on time and time is your stock in trade, you need to be efficient. Make sure that you know work that can be done by cheaper resources within your firm is really handled by the cheaper resources so that you're efficient as a business and you're also efficient in terms of the pricing that you ultimately give to your clients. And at the end of it all, once you're done with, with your billing, um, what you need to remember is that you're developing relationships with your clients. You need to maintain those relationships. And the only way you can do that, again, it takes me to the first point that, that I shared with you is ensuring that we provide value for money. That is the only way that your clients will keep on coming back to you or referring work to you. Make sure that the piece of assignment that you've delivered to the client is one that the client 
is happy to pay for for the amount of you know amount of fees that you have requested for so that at the end of it all the relationship with your with your clients is a mutual relationship that is beneficial to you and to your clients as well and with those few remarks i appreciate so much again for the opportunity and request that i hand over the mic um, back to Harriet. thank you thank you very much for that insightful conversation i've surely learned a lot being a young advocate, uh, and I'll continue learning. Uh, um, uh, I'll proceed with the next presentation, and uh, and still insist on the members present. If you have a question to Miss Stella, kindly post it on the chat box so that we can address it. Uh, our next panelist will be Mr. Isaac Bizumi. Okay, I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce correctly, but Bizum Riei. Uh, Isaac is the founding and principal partner at Lex Chambers. He heads the corporate and commercial practice desk. Uh, he, is, he, ha he has also been an, an editor at Lex Journal. Uh, the full profile can be shared later. As without further ado, kindly Mr. Isaac Buzemeri. I invite you for your presentation. I'm sorry for pronouncing your name irregularly. No, Harriet, thank you very much for trying to pronounce my name. I give you five credit uh, for trying. Yeah, thank you very much for having me here on this session. Um, it's always my pleasure to I have an opportunity to talk to younger lawyers uh, because sometimes I think experience is the best and accurate teacher. Uh, so what I'm going to the younger lawyers is not about, uh, it's basically not from the go-go or whatever, it's just from the, my personal experience for the last 13 years. Um, my topic for discussion uh, centers around attracting and retaining clients by leveraging on good branding and IT services. I want to say that um, I think uh, Council Alex already presented the business aspect of legal practice and I want to believe that it should cease to be a debate whether legal practice is a business or not. Uh, in our legal, uh, in our statute establishing the Rwanda Bar Association, um, it is very clear that an advocate must able to account for taxes and you know from that aspect a tax taxes uh, comes after profit so the moment now you feel that you have to pay tax you have to understand that and operate in a way that a business person operates and in order for you to make profits and sustain yourself in the sector, you have to do all what other business people do, but you limit yourself to the professional uh, requirements. So how do you now as a business, as a business person, how do you leverage uh, on good branding and IT to retain, uh, to, you know, to source out, to attract and retain clients? I want to say that the first thing that you have to do, you have to start with good branding, is that started by branding yourself. 
So you don't have to be different. You may be probably the managing partner, all the partners in your firm, including by their support staff. You have to, they have to brand themselves and for the support staff and associates, the firm must support them to brand themselves. And branding in the name of the firm. So you, you can't really be different from your firm. So where the firm is, uh, looks like this and, uh, and you look like this, or you look attractive, you, you own a brand in your community, but your firm has no brand. So what I'm saying that good branding starts, starts with the founders. And, and those who are practicing in the farm. And the good branding is not about the trademark, it's not about the website. Honorary. Those are, those are so important, but from the, uh, from the content, uh, from the fundamental perspective of it, good branding is both content and visibility the, and the two have to have, have to be together maybe not at the same time but it has to be together at a certain point content when i say content i mean that your firm must be known for a particular or specific contents of practice. That is specialization. But also in that specialization, your content must be one that people identify your firm with. Say if you are incorporate, then you should be able to be known that your corporate practice is a content rich. Because if you if you brand your if you brand your offices or you brand yourself without the content, we call that, I would call that as a fashion designer, where people just dress on the fashion show and then tomorrow they no longer dress themselves. So, content is very important in a way that you will be looked, you will be searched, followed wherever you are by the client because of the content. Imagine if you are sick and you are in this, uh, or maybe the doctor uh, who diagnoses you tells you, oh, well, you need to see Dr. X. He's the one who can cure your disease. You have to do anything. Look for that doctor. Invest, prepare resources, ensure that the doctor, when you get that doctor, is going to treat you. So there is that trust that you have, you have, and the expectation that you have in that doctor. In the same way, when you have a content, people like patients when they come to you. So clients do not come to you because you you were together last night in a pub, but they have to come to you. Because, yes, they know you, but again, they appreciate that you are able to provide solutions to their legal problems. So, content is very important in terms of brand, good branding. And on the visibility, I want to say that no matter how you are good in the content of law and providing legal solutions, but if you are not visible, and when I'm talking visibility, I'm not talking um, a sign post. 
I'm not talking about to, um, I'm not talking about, you know, the address on Google Map, wherever. But visible in all ways, you can. And when talking of visibility, we're also talking, we're also including the, the service where you render your content. So, uh, I'm, I don't know whether in other East African countries, law firms are allowed to advertise. I think I remember in Kenya, there was one time when there was a high court decision, uh, which seems to suggest that uh, law firms can advertise. Uh, I think I was briefed about it, but I never read it. But uh, specifically in Rwanda, we are not allowed to advertise. We are not allowed to ad advertise, you have to find other ways to ensure that people know that you exist and you offer services that they may need. And so when they even come, when they even come, when they see you out there, that's why I say that you need to start branding yourself. When you brand yourself, people you create curiosity in the people to say, I wish to visit that farm one day. And when they come, it should how they saw you out there should actually be the same in the office. So we sell services, we don't sell products, and the services includes a lot. It's intangible, as uh, one of the uh, panelists say. So there are so many intangible aspects in the services that will satisfy the client. And upon his or her satisfaction, he, will, he or she will be willing to pay a amount of fees that of course is reasonable as the um, uh, council stairs just said. But it is, it, it, will, it will not attract and retain your client if they come first time, second time, and they don't feel comfort when they are with you in your farm. They start requesting you that, can we meet can you come to my office or can we meet in a certain hotel or wherever and we discuss? Because they are not comfortable. So, branding, as I said, goes much than uh, content and visibility is not a sim simple appearances, but also stretches to the way you handle your clients. Remember, we are talking about how you attract and retain. You may attract the clients outside the there because the way they saw you, because the way you, you spoke on um, in a certain event, the way your business cards look like. But when they come, when they come to your office, that will be the last time probably they, they will come there. So you have to be sure that the client. Say it again. Uh, request to wind up as I can okay. see how many minutes do I have to wind up I can give you three minutes perhaps thank you so what I'm saying is that uh, your, your clients must, to retain a client is actually very 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 much important than even attracting them because the way we do our business one client refer to you many, 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 and many. And so you have to find a way how to attract them. Attracting them requires even capital, giving them a good treat, making them, inviting them to a session, sometimes free sessions, and you ask, you ask them to, um, you know, a Q&A session. Uh, share with them um, a cup of tea or coffee as you are asking them how how best you can. Them. 
go for feedback from them and you swear so that you are you are very much concerned about them you remember them and one of the things one of the challenges that uh, lawyers tend to, to think is that the client the client relationship end on a case you know even when the client has ceased uh, you have sorted this case keep a contact with him or her keep asking sending mail uh, seasonal greetings, things like that, calls. So in short, I want to say that um, good branding ensure the content of visibility. Now on IT, as I summarize in one minute, IT Council. is simple about efficiency. Um, about efficiency Mr. Isaac, can you hear me? Yes, please. I can hear you. Okay. I could not yes, hear I you. Know. That is why. That is why I okay. interrupted. My apologies. Okay. Uh, I was saying that IT, IT is about efficiency and being accountable easily to your client and how you can facilitate your client to access you easily using the technology. So, IT is now indispensable in legal practice. Um, we need to invest in it, and that those efficiencies will attain your clients to yourself. Um, because of time, let me end up here. Probably I'll be able, I'll be ready to answer any questions. Thank you, Harriet. Thank you, everyone. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Be on the lookout for questions at the comment section. And if possible, you can respond to ones that apply and ones, the ones that you're able to respond to. Uh, for the next panelist, I have been uh, informed that council, senior counsel John Chigiti is on session right now. And I'd love to introduce him so that he can make his presentation on the law firm business model. Uh, Senior Counsel John Sigiti is an advocate practicing under the Law Society of Kenya. He practices in the name and style of Chigiti and Company Advocates, Chigiti and Chigiti Advocates in Kenya. He's also a passionate mentor for young advocates all across the board. Uh, welcome, Senior Counsel. Hello, everybody. Hello. And uh, good afternoon. I believe we are all in uh, East Africa. Um, yeah, I am honored to be the next panelist. I have been asked to speak to an item which is not very difficult, but can be problematic. You are in law firms you are walking into a business, you are walking into a space where you're going to be saying this is the bread and butter, the fountain of your bread and butter. How must, must it work? It is simple from outside, but from inside, it can be a nightmare. So I will I go very briefly with my interesting slides. As you can see, they're running a law firm as a business is the subject of the day. So time, you can go to the slide you were at a time. Time, as you can see, my slides are just blank and as, a, as empty as can be. So time is your biggest asset as a business lady as a businessman or as an intersex person if you're getting into the space of doing business as a lawyer you must always remember your enemy is time how do you manage your time how much time do you have how much time do you have to do your pleadings to go do your marketing to prepare your submissions, to do office management issues. 
everything just flows and rotates around time. So in order to succeed, you must be a good time manager. This is a discipline that is going to betray you, that is going to lead you into spaces that you never thought you could go as an advocate. So the minute you know how to manage your time, your clock, you're done, you're good. For those who do pro bono work, you'll ask yourself, how many hours do I dedicate to the pro bono platform, to the pro bono folders? Indeed, you must manage your work well. If you're doing corporate stuff, if you're doing work that is involving a lot of litigation, if you don't know how to manage your clock, you will waste a lot of time doing the wrong things, getting no income, complaining all the way, and then you will find yourself in the wrong footing. So your first clock, your first enemy, your first entry as a friend and as an enemy is your time. No one will manage your clock for you. Next slide. Who are you? Where is your focus? Where's your mission? Where's your core value? What drives you? What are your objectives? Where do you want to go in the next one year, the next three years, six years and 20 years and on? How do you look like? Are you able to project? Are you able to plan? Are you able to purpose where you want to go? So that you must travel very far and look at where you are today and ask yourself, did I plan well? Did I harness my slots well? Did I have a focus? Was I, was I all over the place doing everything that could be done under the, the sun? That question is critical. Again, your compass belongs to you. Focus far, target big objectives, plan within your timelines, plan within your resources, but have a vision and you will succeed. Next slide. Marketing. Your marketing tools must speak to your vision, must be tied to your clock. Are you able to generate marketing skills, entries, tools, mechanisms, structures? Are you up to speed with the current platforms like you can see there? Are you still sending mail through the physical through the bicycle, through the old ways, or are you digitally available as a law firm? We must wake up to the realities of the day. We must thank the lessons that we have learned from the entries of COVID so that we are looking at the emerging, the emerging potential spaces that will enable you to have your visibility. I had a previous speaker speak about uh, visibility you must be up to speed with the market patterns. If you're doing business, you are in oil and uh, gas, you are doing human rights, you're doing family law. How do you strategize your mission, your time, your clock to meet with your marketing goals? So that you're not just saying, I need to know how to market. You must ask yourself, yes, I'm marketing. When I get 100,000 Kenya shillings or Uganda dollars, or you get Tanzanian dollars, whatever the unit it is, what do I do with that money? What is my vision? Yes, marketing, good income, and then? So the marketing must also call, resonate with your vision. And there must be a timeline, immediate, mid, and long-term marketing strategies. Next slide. Cost cutting. Slash, slash, and slash your costs. Don't be a spendthrift. Don't be a rich, in quotes, lawyer. Spend less. Save and save and save like a church mouse. Hide that money somewhere. Save and save a lot. How do you save? By cutting costs the miscellaneous expenses, the many biro pens that you keep buying, 
the many pieces of stationery, style, branded, I don't know which one, the most expensive things in town are with, with you. The best car in town is with you. The best houses is a lawyer's house. My friend, invest fast, save a lot. Join your cooperative societies. Package, package, make money into that space for a rainy day. Spend less, no one will kill you for spending less. It will be a good way to achieve your future vision objectives. Next. Good management, your space is full of people, be it your law firm, be it the courtroom, be it your client's platform. If you're a poor manager, you're dead. A lawyer who is not a good manager must employ managers, human resources managers, financial experts, but make sure you're on top of things, manage your law firm, manage your events, know everybody within it, know how to deal with the team building conversations, but be a good manager. And clearly, a good manager manages their time. A good manager manages their costs. And a good manager has a good plan, a good vision. Get a hold of yourself. Don't say you don't have clients. Don't say your clients are very few. Start with the few that you have. Manage your clients well, manage your briefs well, manage your marketing strategies well, and you're good to go. Next. Statutory compliances. I had the other speaker speak about this, very critical. Start very early. Start with a small coin. Your revenue, your tax, comply with the taxman's requirements. You will find that 10 years down the road, the road a statutory compliance that you breached will come to haunt you. Deal with it now. Behave, obey, meet your obligations. If it is compliance with the law societies, comply. If it's the indemnity covers, comply. Irrespective of what it is, please, I cry, beseech you start now. It's not hard today. It will be impossible tomorrow. Do it today. Don't postpone. Thank you. If you want to reach me, that's my marketing platform. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senior Council. That was short but precise, and we really appreciate. Uh, should the members have questions, you can post so that Mr. Chigichi can address the same. Uh, on to the next presentation. Uh, I would love to invite um, Ida Juma. Ida Juma is a partner at Rubea and Company Advocates. She acts for corporates in commercial related disputes concerning the inter interpretation agreements and breach of contract and damages claims resulting from breach of the terms of agreements. She's basically involved in litigation, arbitration and legal services acquired through the assistance of numerous cases handled before the courts and tribunals in Burundi on behalf of various clients. Uh, welcome Ida Juma, you can make your presentation. Uh, I cannot hear you. Uh, I don't know if it's on your end. Hello. Hello, now I can hear you, can proceed. Yeah. 
Thank you for very much, uh, Harriet, for the kind introduction. I am honored to be part in that webinar. Uh, and it's uh, the good opportunity for me to chair, to chair with uh, young, young lawyers my experience on expense and uh, spending management strategy. Uh, as we know, uh, the law firm, uh, a new law firm as uh, a law firm with a long experience need to set up strategies, strat strategies on expenses and spending management. In this presentation, I will explore the top strategies on the above matter. Uh, the first strategies which uh, we must uh, focus on is uh, the the a strategic budget as a roadmap that ties the financial goals of a law firm directed to his uh, firm work. It appears we've lost Miss Ida. Miss Agatha, are you on session? Very well. Uh, I believe we can proceed with the next presenter as we address the issue that has the challenge that has faced the internet challenge that has faced Ms. Ida Juma. Uh, on the next session uh, will be about so, staff. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. sorry for, okay. for the network. It's not okay, uh, okay. very good. Okay. I was told that, uh, however, uh, it's uh, very necessary to keep in mind that in strategic budgets, expense should follow those you knew. Even the known expense need to be adjusted at time. Another strategic, strategic uh, I want to share with a young, young lawyer is uh, outsourcing. Uh, they have to examine potential of uh, outsourcing service like uh, IT management to the legal time, and uh, also apart from pay, paying salary uh, when they engage employees, and also when they, ha they have to consider benefit and employment taxes. So the outsourcing allows to the young lawyers to get express services at much better prices point than in house employees. Another uh, strategic that um, I can share with uh, them is the reporting efficiency. They having to really, to know the really time to secure to create and consistent centralized data saves a lot of time accessing and reporting on documents, matters, and financial. Uh, and uh, another thing, uh, they must, at a lot of time, is wasted by legal staff of all seniorists when they manual co complete report for multiple on and offline sources. They must also know that they, by using local spend management software, like uh, custom reports and as required by the business can be scheduled for automatic 
click creation and delivered it to stakeholders by email. Another strategy which uh, is uh, very important is technology. They, they must think of uh, technology overhead, not as a cost-cutting tool, but rather an experience like maximizing one. In that case, it uh, will be good to remote work situation that, so there's no need for expensive servers and in-office network, outdated telecom system and powerful but immovable printer sc sc scanners. Instead, they can replace them with cloud-based system for nearly everything like document storage and sharing, telephone and emailing services and practice management system. Another uh, strategies which uh, I can share is um, the virtual office. Uh, as uh, we know, the virtual office uh in our in our days we not every law needs an actual physical office space or at least not uh, one where all your employees will dwell instead they can choose a more affordable conference space for greeting clients whereas the employees can actually do their research and other work for home or working area in the seats. So the digital tools now enable, uh, they, have, they can have conference call and virtual meeting on regular basis, which allow them to reduce, to reduce costs even further and switch to a more remote business model. So another uh, strategy which um, is uh, also very important is uh, automate the accounting process. Uh, this can be easily achieved by investing in low cost automation solution that tend to a range of the sectors. For example, please, please Ida, if I may interrupt, uh, kindly wind up as we are running out of time. Yeah, they can let an accounting prof platform tend to the invoices, notification, employment payment, and the like, and uh, let the staff take care of relevant tasks at hand. Another strategy uh, that I can share is the review and control. Uh, it's the most important and recommended approach in order to improve the law firm profitability. In that case, uh, if uh, once the law firm eliminates unnecessary spending and makes the appropriate adjustment to the budget and increase the profit, it's very important to maintain the same expense structures. The law firm can be invested in the capacity building of uh, the general lawyers and uh, other projects. So in conclusion, I can say that uh, it will be uh, very important and uh, the, the young lawyer need to write in order to uh, to manage the expense and the spending. They need to write a solid expense policy uh, that reflects the needs of uh, the companies, its managers and leaders and its staff. They must also be fair, transparent and comprehensive with the police, they must provide an easy way for employees to submit the expense reports. Uh, they need also to keep everyone from manager to the staff accountable 
throughout the entire process. And another thing is to, to be timely with employees' reimbursement, income revenue, so they not carry out balances. The last one is to conduct regular audits of the process and pay attention to flags and normal that could signal the abuses and fraud. I finish with uh, to ask him, don't spend the money that spending, but spend the money with the aim of gaining more money. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Ida. Uh, we will promptly proceed with the final panelists before we get the final address by the president of the East African Law Society. Uh, so for the next panelists, uh, the panelist uh, is Rich Malwal. He will be speaking on staffing and the master professionals to get you started. Uh, Mr. Rich Malwal is, uh, uh, okay, I'll, I'll invite him and he'll share the, the profile on our chat for, uh, forum for anyone who would love to interact with him. Uh, but basically he is the managing partner at the Ancestral Advocates and the Executive Director at the Screen of Rights, a human rights national non-governmental organization registered in accordance with the laws of South Sudan. He is the Deputy Secretary of Information at South Sudan Bar Association and the, a, a fellow at the US Institute of Peace. Welcome, Mr. Lual. Mr. Rich, my um, Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I understand that uh, names uh, in East Africa are not necessarily uh, known so um, uh, given the fact that uh, we are trying to also learn in a cross-cultural manner and then i don't bother my name being called uh, uh, wrongly uh, my name is Raich Malwal and i believe that my um, my entire um, background has been narrated um, literally i'm going to talk about what i have been tasked to talk about um, model of practice or um, the legal practice. Uh, but perhaps we share the same basket, not so much far away from uh, other countries within uh, the East African uh, region. Um, law firm capacity as a business, you will need to uh, staff your law firm uh, with able personalities, with uh, expertise required for the law firm to be able uh, to, to progress. Um, for example, uh, you will need to uh, have um, organ business and administrative tasks uh, that keep you focusing in very important initiatives. Uh, for example, you have a case to litigate. If you don't have a right that you will need uh, necessarily, yes, you don't, uh, if you and support, you may need to achieve the goal that is required for the law firm. And then it is very necessary that we are able to, uh, to focus uh, our staffing towards our um, uh, law firm aim. For example, if, if, if your law firm aims at uh, environmental cases, and then you need to be able to, to get the right people in place. Also, um, you don't need to have lack of time and energy to execute your strategies, it's still, uh, uh, you know, to serve your, your clients. Uh, your firm's insufficiency uh, means uh, that your team uh, does not have the right sacrificing uh, element, and you will need the right um, team in order to have the sufficiency uh, of your of your services. Um, on the other hand, um, the capacity of your law firm you can develop it at uh, you know at your time, and also depending on on what you want. 
for example, you are aiming higher and then you need to train your that is specific uh, challenge. Um, we can also talk about maximization of uh, the law firm practice uh, using accelerators proven approach uh, where we can be able to at least like for example new law firms uh, will face challenges whether in capacity and expertise or else uh, the practice uh, as well as financial capacities could be lower too but the more you have financial capacities the more you will also employ uh, the right people in the law firm uh, because at a time uh, people with the right expertise, uh, they will require also um, some cash to be paid. And also, um, law firm must accelerate um, their practice uh, using also, even if you, you feel like uh, a certain scheme is lacking, extend a hand of, and be able to, um, uh, to reach to that level that you had wanted that personality to be. Uh, you must have also a solution-driven uh, coaching where you are not alone in the business. Uh, you have some other people that you can be able to consult. Uh, when you, you don't know something, you can always approach a senior counsel in the field and be able to learn from them. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when you sit down and discuss as lawyers, you'll be able to discuss some powerful solution you will uh, you know a solution to um, you also need to have checks for example as a uh, by month time that you may think is appropriate sit down and check your speeds where you respond to clients needs and be able to improve where necess uh, where necessity um, is required um also inside sessions with experts you, you see big time lawyers that you can always approach converse with them discover the um, um and hence you uh, that you have equip yourself and your team uh, the right expertise and the right team uh, in place i believe i wouldn't uh, go further because I was only tasked to talk on the on the staffing of, of uh, law firms. If there are questions, I will be able to. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, uh, like, uh, like Mr. Malwal has mentioned, should you have any questions? You can post them on the chat box. Uh, I will finally uh, invite the president of the East African Law Society uh, to address for a short while before we engage in the plenary session. Welcome, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. Let me take this opportunity to thank the panelists. Mine is just a brief remarks. Thank first of all the Young Lawyers Committee for the energy you have brought into the East African Law Society. I think every month we are holding a Young Lawyers Mentoring Session. Thank you to your organization and um, it's hopeful. I'm sure so many people are, are being impacted by the lessons that are being shared. I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of the ELS to thank the panelists. I will not mention all their names. Um, but thank you so, 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 so much for sparing your time. It's about two hours between two and four o'clock. Thank you for sparing your time and sharing lessons with the young lawyers. We are extremely grateful on behalf of the young lawyers. Thank you again. And um, wishing you um, um, a, dis a great discussion as you conclude. Thank you so much. Uh Thank you. Uh, I'd love now to invite Ms. Brenda Makoha to take us through the plenary session. Uh, I can see she has commented that most of the questions have been answered. Perhaps if you have a question in regards to today's presentation, you can pause so that uh, the panelists may address before we 
close the session. Feel free, you can raise your hand so that we can see you and respond. Miss Brenda, I can see Mr. Philip Munabi. Hello, everyone. Yes, my name is Brenda. Uh, Philip Munabi has a question. He yes. raised his hand. Perhaps the host can allow him to speak. I can't do it from my end. Mr. Philip, you can proceed. Yeah. Sorry, can I be heard? Yes, you can proceed. My question uh, would be more personal than general, but uh, it 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 really moves around how if it was addressed to senior counsel like uh, Chigiti, how has he managed? to thrive through the times. Of course, we've had, uh, we cannot say that it is uh, only COVID that has brought changes in practice and other modules of work. But then, of course, there have been situations, tough times for all law firms. Uh, how do you manage to stay into business despite other challenges that may make you feel like closing down? Uh, I'll give an example. Uh, many firms, I don't know if it's a mistake or it's by design, but many firms uh, will want to start at a high notch, employ uh, a good number of staff, but then you find along the way you can't move on. So it is either partners dropping out or closing. How do you manage to thrive and make successful business. Thank you. Senior Council Chigiti. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, my answer lies in the slides I shared. Just manage your time, cut the costs, save, have a vision. That's it. You'll be good when the rainy day comes, when COVID comes. Plan, have a vision, manage yourself well, save, cut on costs, have a vision. When these things come, Instead of going down, instead of going south, you'll be moving north. That's how I survive. Well, uh, I have. I also have a question in regards to marketing. How do you package yourself? How do you market yourself as a young lawyer so that you can access these clients? For the young people, the young colleagues, you are lucky because you have a lot of electronic and social and ICT possibilities. Be very alive and present in the places like LinkedIn. Keep posting blogs. Avoid the social media, which doesn't add value to you as a professional. Read and pass, but develop conversations. You know your strengths in your diversity. In that area where you're very strong, start posting early content that is going to build. Get the judgments, analyze them, and post the analysis. Think about doing publications. Those are the entries that will start marketing you very early. People will develop interest in you. And finally,
do not be scattered all over the place. Target one area and hold and hold and build on that line like it was never before. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brenda? Yes, uh, we, I can see uh, Senior Council Alex. Resida also has uh, has raised up his hand. So maybe Senior, you can speak. Thank you. Uh, just to add on to what uh, to what John has shared in response to 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 those uh, particularly the first question. Now, uh, how do you weather the storm when it comes? You, you, you can only weather it when you have when you build the ark. And you build the ark by the tools that uh, that John has shared. Uh, remember, uh, in the presentation in the keynote address, I did say, do we ask ourselves when we set out, do you have a business plan? Do you know where you're driving to? Do you know what you want to do? Do you know what you want to achieve? So don't just set up because there's a million Kenya shillings and you can pay rent and do this and this. Then what happens to three years downstream? How have you planned for that? So plan, plan, plan. Have a vision. Populate that plan. Do your budgeting. Understand your costing. Understand what it takes to run a law firm. There's a difference between being a lawyer and being a manager, or even a manager of a law firm, including your own. Address all those. Be prepared. But most of all, professionalism, skill tooling, and being dependable. When you have all these tools, don't worry about the storms. We, 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 won't go. we see them. They, they won't end with COVID. They still come. And we survive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senior, for those kind remarks. Um, there was uh, someone who had raised their hand, but has I think they have lowered them again. Uh, Bernice Kira asks if it's possible to get Senior Council Chigiti's slides. Uh, I think the society will lie us with him and see how we will be able to share them in due course. And I think that is all from my end. I'm not seeing any other questions. So maybe Harriet, I can hand over to you so that you can close. Uh, uh, my final uh, remark will maybe ask if the panelists have anything else to add, if either, either if any, any of the panelists, uh, I remember Ms. Stella had indicated that she would have loved to have made her presentation after Senior Council Chigiti. I don't know if she has a comment. Um, thank you, Harriet, um, and it's good that you remembered. I must take this opportunity to um, thank um, Senior Council Chigiti for the presentation. Um, it basically, um, you know, you know, um, communicated what I was really waiting to hear. You know, the principles that he has been alluding to are, in my view, you know, the cornerstone for anyone to run a successful um, law firm. So thank you so much, you know, for echoing that again. Um, time, as I said, again, is our stock in trade. We need to make sure that we do justice to ourselves and to our clients. And, you know, nobody has put it um, better as Senior Council Chigiti has. So thank you so much for that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there being no other comments and uh, contributions by participants, I'd, I'd mark the session as 
close as ending. And you can log out at your own pleasure. We are done.